personally was a brother with somebody that you can always count on no matter what um, from the littlest things like we used to have conversations about the stupidest things too and he would still be interested in it um, and that was the type of character he was that like although like you may think like oh you know a lot of people have titles for him a lot of people have like a lot of things that degrade him or make him seem like a bad person when all in reality he just had a big heart and that's what happens to him people with a big heart like they just really they really get hated on they really get portrayed as something that they're not and I think that that's what a lot of people did to Lewis he was pure you know what I'm saying he was real pure you know you, you talk to him and he could be the person to talk to you feel me he was always that person that can give you good advice because he was really a good person to talk to you know what I mean he was real he was real cool you know what I'm saying man real tall I was fam and he was just a person who was so smart at anything he wanted to do. You know what I mean? That that's made it right there. You know what I mean? He knew what he, you know, he knew what he was doing, my nigga. It was like a brother to us, you know? I don't know, like every time like we'll get into problems with dudes, he'll be there. And if we always tell him if he got into problems with females to call us, you know, so it was like he was like our, our big brother. He was a good dude, man. He it wasn't about games or no bullshit, mad humble. My auntie, my man, my auntie was like, the man you want to be next to, you know? Even if you had beef for him, even if you was cool with him, you wanted to be next to him, you just bring joy to the day, like a day, a nice day out. El mate paraba fuera, everybody around him. Not on some beef shit, not on some rowdy shit, but damo tu tranquilo, chilling, you know? That's how we used to go about our days with him. Just chilling, he used to do his thing, you know? That I don't know about. What I know about is my dad the light of the party, like my man Cito said. Before it, before it was bangs, nigga, you know what I'm saying? We used to before just that. chill, nigga. Before, like, we used to ride bikes, and we used to play ball, my nigga. We used to play baseball right here, my nigga, in Lil' Fenway. You know what I'm saying, my nigga? We play football right here on the strip, my nigga. My dad would, you feel me? My dad would throw from the top of the... From the top of the block, nigga, that nigga will throw it all the way down there past that red factory, my nigga, you feel me? Not even trying to force it, my nigga. That, that's how niggas, you know what I'm saying, every day, nigga. Then you know how shit happens, niggas grow up. But, nigga, he knew me since, nigga. I couldn't even come out the stoops, you feel me? 
That's for life, nigga. That's how deep this shit is for my nigga, dog. It's for life, my nigga. <laughs> Troncoso, popularmente mato, era un muchacho, para mí, mi hijo potizo, porque un muchacho que yo lo, lo mandaba para donde quiera, que yo quisiera, nunca me faltó el respeto, eh, para mí era mi hijo potizo, me cuidaba, eh, Luis para mí dejó, ha dejado un vacío que no es fácil llenarlo. Eh, lo recuerdo cada día de mi vida, a veces creo que, que lo tengo al frente. Era un, un gran muchacho, un muchacho grande, un muchacho que, que mentalmente no creció como un hombre, aunque tenía tamaño de, de un burdo, pero era un muchacho juguetón, un muchacho, muchacho grande, lo que es eh, un muchacho que, que no te hace daño. Eh, un muchacho de respeto, respetaba al, tanto los chiquitos como los grandes, eh, por lo menos en lo que yo pude eh, ver a Luis por aquí. Eh, no puedo decir nada contrario de él. That nigga was a real dude, you know what I mean? And if he didn't know you were holding a wall, you was real good to the nigga, he'll rap you to the end, you know what I mean? And that's how I felt with him, you know what I mean? Wherever we see each other, I'll go round down both boys and he'll show me mad love, like yo P. What's good, my nigga, you know what I'm saying? I only knew Mata for like a year and a couple months. I didn't really know him like that, but the time that I did spend with him and I did share with him, he showed me a lot. He was a kind person. He was it, he was actually more of a, a of a kid a kid person. I'm right here trying to do Spider-Man. Ah, El monito. <laughs> Gorilla, gorilla. <laughs> Yo mato, dime a ver, ¿qué tú le vas a hacer white boy? Le voy a meter la mano, el palomo ese. Esto no sirve para nada. I got, I got some. Ay, like he always did everything for the kids like he would see the kids and he would do things more for the kids he was a real friendly person I mean I can't explain it he has so much love for everyone like, he was like one of the main people that I could really count on like if anything, other than my mom or my dad, um, he would, he always used to tell me that, um, that I was, that I had something special and stuff, cause when I was little, he used to tell everybody on the, on, on the street and stuff to like, tell me to dance, cause as you know in the beginning, you see me dancing. And ever since then, he used to tell people give me like dollars for me to dance and stuff. And he used to give me cardboard and stuff. And like, I always used to make him laugh. And like, he always used to surprise me with like stupid stuff, like anything. I know him since he was like 14. I met him through my brother. My brother's Joel. That's my little boy. So ever since then though, we've always kicked it like it was cool, like he was a good friend, he was always there. Siempre que come around the block, he was there. Earliest shit in the morning, he was there, like, I guess he probably slept out there. <laughs> Lewis was, to me, he, he was a caring person. He always, I feel like he always did favor for everyone. He would put everyone first but himself. Louis, my thought was a real nigga. Like, he didn't take no shots from nobody. Like if he had to do something, he'll do it. If he had to do it by himself, he'll do that too. Like he was the type of dude. Like if he's eating, you gonna eat with him. You feel me? Like he don't like like everybody eating with him. You feel me? Like that's the way he was. Real nigga, man.
there was like very few times like that I seen him like down. Like he was always happy and he liked to help people and he like you know, he looked out for everybody and he was just a great person. Like he was a person who was always there for you, who always like gave you anything you, you needed, you know? If he knew that you was in need, he was the first one to be there, you know? And he was the first one that would come to mind. Like, who would do this for me? Who would be there for me right now? You automatically think Lewis. Um, and I think that he's just that. He just had a big heart, for, um, especially for the hood. Like, anybody, he didn't even have to, like, it didn't even have to be his drum. If you was in an interaction with somebody, in a conflict with somebody right there and then, he'll shut it down. Like, excuse me, what's happening here? You know, do, I, do you need my help? Do you need anything from me? Da da da. It didn't even have to be his drum, but if if you were someone he loved and he cared about, he definitely came through um, all the time. And I didn't. And I don't mean that in like through violence or through anything like that. Could be a simple conversation. It could just be checking something real quick. He would do it. In my eyes, my thought was a real ass nigga. I know a lot of people said that. Um, he was a true friend. Whenever you needed something, he was there for you. He was always making jokes, and it was always like when you were around him, it was always everybody was on amp. He used to just just make people like laugh and like a party all the time with him. You know, Louis B. Grosso to me, basically a nigga that kept it humble, kept it official, a nigga. You know, never fucking came out of his character. You know, towards nobody. With us, he was official, you know. He's like a family member, you know? So like that, you know, I, I hear we watch from family. We ain't no gang, you know, we keep it official with everybody. You feel me? On top of that, you know, that nigga to us was more like a brother to us, you feel me? Yeah, the father, um, I remember one time we was, we was supposed to ride out. He stopped everything we was doing to, to go get his daughter something she needed. Um, he was loyal, you know, he was a good friend. He never let two people he knew have beef. Or, you know, let, uh, until he would, he would try to mediate it so it wouldn't even have to get to beef. I, I met him, you know, before he died, like a, a couple years before he died. And before that, before I even knew him, that I spoke to him, and I, I used to hear his name ring bells. Mata this, mata that. I'm like, damn, who is this guy? I gotta meet this guy, you know? Even on the basketball court, when he was little, 13, 14, you know what I'm saying? He always played ball. You know what I'm saying? Like, attitude is always right, but you don't disrespect him, he ain't gonna disrespect you. You feel me? So, my thought was that dude, man. He was that dude. That's who he was. He was, he was a better nigga, bro. That was my dude, honestly. Like, nigga, for years, man. I, I, I grew, I met this dude when he was like seven, maybe. Plain boy, you know what I mean? My best, my man, to the bone. He always kept it a hundred. He's from Boston Street. I'm from. FHP, you feel me? And I've been knowing him since I came to the state, so Martha's a real dude to the foe. If you keep it cool with him, he keep it cool with you. You calling that rap? I met Martha a couple of years back. I was in high school. Um, we were in this little group called Pink Illusions, and one of the girls named Natalie, that was her blog. So she introduced us to other guys from Boylston and Mata was like the main nigga who like always stood out always always knew how to keep everything live even if we had nothing to do I met him as Mata when they said Louis I didn't know who was Louis I always knew him as Mata I always seen him every morning every morning I would look out my window on Boylston Street and the first person I would see was him with his Red Rock and his Boston Herald and smoking his cigarette. And you know, he used to always yell out, woo woo, it's me, bitches, to my <laughs> friends and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, that's my thing. Bro, we always used to have fun. Play hide be in the hood, playing hide and The cops and robbers, new school versus old school, all that shit. I was around for all that shit. I even got wedges from that nigga. That nigga we grew up together, like, you know, my cousins live right there like two houses down and, and I don't know if you could point the camera that way that house right there like that was a family's house and you know like I used to come down from New York all the time like I never really lived in Boston my cousin Gary and Bismarck lived right here on the street you know so like 
He was always here playing baseball, and I used to come out, he used to be my cousins, and you know, like, that's how I basically got introduced to everybody when I was about, like, I could say 11, 12 years old. <laughs> you know, we used to chill all the time, come out. His cousin David, that's, that's, that's my man, like, his father, my father is, like, mad cool, like, you know, like, Mata, like, every time I seen him, like, to me, it wasn't even Mata, like, it was just somebody, like, that I grew up with, like, somebody that, that like, I played baseball with, like, La Plaquita, and, Riding bikes and GTs and dinos, like before it was all anything like any drama or any beef, any and none of that guns. We didn't know none of none of that, man. Like it was just kids playing and you know, like as I grew older, like, you know, in, in a way, you know, like people just chose their path and their way and then we never really started chilling as much, but every time we seen each other, I used to come through from New York to visit my family. Everybody know my father, Manuel, you know what I mean? Like he always used to be out here and he used to be like, you know, like, yo, what up? Like, you know, like, you know, your friend when you like, when you little, like, basically that's what it was. It wasn't even like about nothing. We never talked about no beef to tell you the truth. Or... He gave a voice to those that were silenced. You know what I'm saying? So he was the voice of those people that were either intimidated to say something. He was the voice of those people that were, um, that were scared to say something. He brought light. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like. You would think of him as like everybody would think of him like oh I'm the you know I'm the sh can I swear on here I'm the shit or you would think you think people like oh I'm the shit I'm this I'm that I hold this down hold that it's not even like that he kind of did it because of for other people so like why does he get recognized by his baseball coach by you know by his barber by people down the street by you know la señora down the street you know who used to cook for the neighborhood like why is he known for that why is he known even to her because of that. Like, he used to always be that voice. He used to say things, what it was, how it was, um, when it was. Like, he used to just put it out there. And I think that's why he was known. And he had a way of, like, speaking to people. Even, like, to viejitas or even to my mom. You know what I'm saying? Like, my mom, when he spoke to her, he knew how to respect her. He knew how to, like, attend to her. He knew, he knew the level of respect. He had values. He had morals. And he shown them. You know what I'm saying? And that's what made who he was. He was such a character that, like... He was one of those people that walks in and like you don't even know him and he'll just sit there and, and kick it with you, you know? And he'll he'll vibe with you and he'll let you know what it is. He was a man of his word, you feel me? He ain't type of dude that, you know what I'm saying, will say something in your face and not mean it, you know what I'm saying? And, and just lie, nah. He, he, he was legit, you know what I'm saying? Everybody know who he was. That's why his love stretches from here to Carajo Land, my nigga, you feel me? Nigga, everybody know Mark Ma Taco Colo, you know what I'm saying? Luis Strong you know what I'm saying? He was a warrior. Um, he was a he was a good person. He had a good heart. Like he looked out for everyone. Um, and at one point in my life, I lost a dear brother, he, uh, a close friend, who I would call a brother. And um, Mata Lewis was around for the time that that happened. And um, he was like, "Yo, oh, whenever you need a shoulder to cry on, dog, I'm here." Like you know, Kev was my boy too. He was my brother too, you know, and um, my brother uh, always played ball with him and they loved being on the same team because they were so dominant together. I used to hate being on the opposing team because, you know, they would just dominate us on the basketball court, um, those two. So um, he was a very powerful person. He was a warrior. Um, he, he, he never let his emotions show sometimes, you know, so whenever I see him on an up and up, um, he talked to me and we talk about some of those things of what he's going through, his babies, his babies, his kids, uh, his family, um, particular lifestyle, how, you know what I'm saying, how he's been doing. And we'd always talk about trying to be positive, trying to, you know, change things. And he always wanted to go down that road. It was just, uh, it was just cut short. You know, it was just something that um, he never got to fulfill. Put that shit on that nigga right there.
It was basically Elm Hill versus Boyce at the time, playing ball, and he was just, he was just always, you know, cool, always happy, you know what I mean? Like, if he was down, you probably meet up, bump into him or something, he'll probably just say one dumb thing, or do something to make you laugh, and he'll make your day. And we used to go down the street to the store, we was like nine years old or ten. We always used to see him going to the store all the time, so that's how we met. And from there, we just got cool, and then you already know from there, started from there. Basketball, baseball, chilling together, and then just being Rose together and, every day. And it was like, I don't know about where we lived, there was a whole bunch of us that when we was young, it just, you feel me, just used to always chill, and just, you know, got that vibe, and looking now, we're like brothers and sisters, you know? My name is Noemi Pineda. I'm the sister... Well, at this moment, I'm the sister mayor. De Mata. Bueno, se enojaba mucho conmigo porque eh, yo siempre he sido como un poquito eh, la maestrita del grupo, pero un fan. Eh. Para quienes no lo conocen, eh, yo lo amaba muchísimo, eh, no solamente porque era el único varón de la familia, sino porque eh, todo me decía que sí. Aunque no lo iba a hacer, siempre me decía que sí. Cuando lo aconsejaba que hacía algo mal hecho, me decía, sí, sí, yo voy a cambiar. Eh, cuando venía muy tarde, que le decía el otro día, eh, mira, tiene que tratar de llegar más temprano porque mami no está durmiendo. Sí, sí, voy a llegar más temprano. Todo lo de la que sí, aunque fallara los cinco minutos. Un día que yo le dije a él, que ya que él era mi único hermano, habíamos, somos todas mujeres, él era el único, 
y la familia de mi esposo era quien estaban haciendo la construcción de la casa. Yo le dije a él que por favor me ayudara a pintar, que me ayudara a pintar el porche, porque yo no te, ya estaba cansada. Bueno, le busco la pintura, le busco la brocha. Me dice, sí, 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 yo te voy a pintar el porche entero. Te prometo que te lo voy a pintar para que no vuelvas a reclamarme nada en lo absoluto. Ok. Wow. Entro a la casa y cuando salgo afuera, eran como 15 minutos, tres tablas pintadas. He was gone. He was, he was just, he was gone. I'm like, I thought you, you're supposed to finish. I mean, what is this? Solo llamo y le digo, mira, pero tú me dijiste a mí que me iba a pintar el pocho. What's going on? I mean, he's like, oh, no, 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 no. No, no. My nigga just called me. I mean, my nigga. What kind of talk is that? Yeah, yeah. My nigga just called me. Don't worry. Tomorrow, I'm going to finish the work. Until now, nothing, no. I end up finishing the damn porch. Yo soy Luis, Luis Manuel Troncoso. Papá de Luis a Troncoso. Él estaba pequeñito y había un otro niño que le daba golpes todos los días. Entonces yo salí para afuera y lo vi al otro niño dándole golpes. Y yo busqué un palo y le dije, vaya a pelear para afuera. Que no, que no va a pelear porque el otro es muy chiquito. Yo le dije, usted va a pelear con él ahora mismo. Entonces él salió para afuera y desde ese día él lo agarró con el palo, le dio y el otro niño más nunca se volvió a meter con él. Después que se hizo hombre, éramos muy amigos. Peleábamos todos los días, yo y él. Todos los días peleábamos. Me decía muchas palabras malas y yo le decía pa palabras a él también, pero que entonces él bajaba la cabeza, bajaba por ahí y subía de una vez para acá arriba y, y, y me besaba. Mi nombre es Elida Pineda. Eh, yo soy la mamá de Luis, troncoso. Para mí Luis era un buen muchacho porque él nunca, con la familia de él en la casa, yo nunca tuve problemas con él. Aunque siempre le, le decía, una vez me dijo que iba a hacer el GD, le pidió el dinero a la otra hermana de él y se lo dio. Y yo le dije, Luis, pero fulana, Iraida te dio el dinero y ¿por qué tú no, no estás haciendo el GD? En esa me dijo que, que se le perdió el dinero. Entonces después volvió y me lo pidió a mí. Y yo se lo dije, yo se lo di, pero yo le dije, pero esta vez yo te voy a, ir a llevar. Y yo fui, lo llevé y lo dejé allá. Y, y él nunca hizo, hizo el GD. Y para sacar la licencia, o le pedí a la hermana de él, la hermana de él siempre le daba el dinero también para la licencia. Y él se lo dio como tres veces y a la última fue que la sac lo sacó. Entonces, cuando nos mudamos aquí, yo siempre como que lo protegía a él. Porque yo siempre me quedaba hasta las hasta la dos y a las tres chequeando por la, por la ventana. Entonces él tenía un problema que nunca, siempre botaba la llave y me tiraba piedra por la ventana. Y ya yo le, le había cogido el hilo de que cuando yo ya que la ventana sonaba ya era porque él me estaba tirando piedra para que le abriera la puerta. Pero yo eh, de Luis ya yo le conocí hasta el paso de, la, de caminar aquí. Y el, y el paso de cómo él me tocaba la puerta, ya yo decía, ese era Luis. Y cuando él, alguna vez él venía, se acotaba él en este mueble y yo me acotaba en el otro. Y ahí no, no podían no hablar. Y cuando se acotaba un rato en este mueble, él cogía para la cocina. Entonces él me decía, oh, pero yo me paré con un pollo. <risa> yo me paré con un pollo porque tú nada más cocinas rolla, bichuel y pollo. Y se comía un chin y se acostaba o, o salía para la calle otra vez. Pero yo nunca me voy a conformar de la muerte de él. Porque yo, yo todavía lo estoy esperando. Like, I knew him here, like inside the house. And 
people it was crazy because they when i would go out they'd be like oh you're lewis's little sister he's mad cool and i wouldn't see it because i'm his little sister like i'd see like this dorky like my brother like it, it, it wouldn't be the same but then when we started like like when our ages started kind of like coming together and we were chilling with the same people and like doing the same things then i saw like oh wow he's he's not as dorky and as silly as he is at home he's like mad like big out here he was like he was in love with his daughters with both of them he really like he was mad happy i was jealous because i was like wow now you have two little girls i'm not gonna get spoiled and he was just like, nah, chill. Like, he would still spoil me. And, like, still spoil them, too. He's like, but pretty soon, you know, it's, you know it's not going to happen, right? Like, this is going to end for you. I was mad at that. But he loved them a lot. And he would take care of them all the time. Enough to, you know, fall in love with them. And now his daughters is just like him. They have, like, the whole ad, like, his his attitude, his swag kind of like, and it's crazy cause they're just two. I I went that year that I got pregnant, like I went on vacation to the Dominican Republic. The December and like I was already pregnant, but I didn't know. And then like, he like was kind of telling me that I was pregnant, but I'm like, I'm not pregnant. Like, so he comes, I was in the bathroom and he knocks on the door. He's like, what happened? I'm like, what do you think? He's like, you're pregnant. He's like, I told you, like, like he was like, like he was just so confident about it. Like he already had been like, and he was just, he was excited. I was just shocked. Like <laughs> that was the last thing I wanted at the moment, but you know, but I feel like now I'm happy and thankful that it happened the way it did. Cause you know, my daughter wouldn't be here. Um, like, he was just excited. Like, he even, he took a picture of um, the pregnancy test. And he had it like on his phone and he was just showing everybody. Like, He was a loving father. He loved his girls so, so, so much. Um, I remember one day, um, Rosie had his oldest daughter Liani and she accidentally told him that she crashed, she scratched her in the cheek. He was so mad. He was so mad. He was so furious. And from there on, I was like, wow, he, he really loves his daughter. He really did love her. He, he used to talk about them all the time. Who's that? Mommy. Uh -oh. oh my God. Who's that baby? Oh, Nino, it's only Nino, okay, because you don't recognize him. Who's that? Who? That's too little, so okay. That's what? 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 That's it's a little Yeah, it's a puppy. Here, you can have this one, Leone. Who's that? Hey. Espérate. Como que espérate? Una freca. Is it a puppy? Oh, you want this one? Yeah. Okay. Puppy? I'm sorry. Baby, baby, puppy. Tu baby, the puppy. That day, I remember, um, like, we were going to a baby shower that day, that afternoon. And that morning, I went out to buy a gift, and he stayed with Liani. Like, he was watching her while I went out. And then, <coughs> like, when I came back, we was just, we was just chilling, then... Like out of nowhere, he decided to go to JP. Like, and I told him, 
like not to go because we had somewhere to go in a couple of hours. And he's like, nah, I'm just gonna go for a little bit. I'll be back by four o'clock. Yeah, I was with him that day. It started in front of my stairs. We was actually walking to um, the park on Brookside and all of a sudden, like, they just decided to go play basketball. So we went to Stony Brook. And I remember getting out of work at 3.30 and passing by Stony Brook and I remember like I had a headache but my mom always like when she when we would pass through there through Boylston we'd always look for like this big dude and like make sure like oh yeah there, there's Lewis we know he's there and I remember we passed by there and we seen him well I we seen everybody playing basketball and then like I like looked and then like laid back again because I had a headache and we just went on our like on our way and then I don't know, we got here like around 4, almost, it was like 4.30, almost 5, and I was laying down, and I got a phone call, and they, and it was from my homegirl, Natalie, she was like, yo, they shot your brother, and I thought like, I don't know, since it was him, I felt like, oh my god, he's untouchable, like, it was probably like, he's fine, it's nothing big, nothing can happen to him, because, whatever, that's what you think, like, you don't automatically assume, oh, well, he's dead. Someone text me or someone call. Something happened. Something weird happened. Um, they told her, but then my phone was ringing a lot at the same time. And um, they kept saying, oh, you know, I think Louis got, got into a fight. I said, oh, my God. Let's see what's, you know, let's, let's see what's going on. So I grabbed her and I told her that... Um, we don't, don't tell anything to my mom. I said, don't say anything. Let's find out what's going on. Because um, I, I kind of, I've been, I have been, I think, maybe the strongest one. But then I, you get to the point, you get to the line that you're not, the, you're not strong anymore. You just, you just collapse. So you, you don't know what to do with things. Um, we left the house. I told her, don't say anything to my mom until we really find out what's going on. And I just told her, hey, I just think it was just a fight. Oh, maybe a fight, you know. So my phone was ringing a lot, and, and people kept calling me and insisting that, you know, something happened worse than a fight. But I wasn't expecting anything worse than that because he wasn't really a troublemaker or, or anything like that. I think it, it, ever since, you know, since he was little, in order for him to fight, you really have to push his buttons. So I really thought that he would just, it was a fight, nothing else. A fight, you know, something went wrong, you know, and maybe he, you know, he got hurt. But I never thought, I never picture anything worse than that. I was there with, with all of them and it was playing basketball and like probably like 20 minutes or 30 minutes into the game that's when everything happened i was i was right beside him you know what i'm saying we we everybody went to the hood to to stony brook to go run ball you know what i'm saying some other niggas idea was like yo let's go run ball niggas didn't even really want to but we went everybody went and the niggas that wanted to play ball didn't even fucking play ball mind you my nigga made it was shitting on niggas playing ball you feel me that's 100 you know what I'm saying? Smacking boys, making wet in threes. I remember all that shit. You know what I'm saying? Like it was yesterday, nigga, that same day. You feel me? Him playing ball, getting it in. And niggas, niggas was all occupied. You feel me? Everybody was all occupied at the moment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, nigga, I, I went to the store. Niggas was sick. Niggas was chilling. That's niggas was all occupied. Niggas, like, thinking about other shit. You feel me? At the moment. Niggas was playing ball. So, we just finished scoring and we we're walking back. And right there, that's when everything happened. Niggas like, like, Reaching for my own, um, I had my shorts on, so I reached for my sweatpants, cause I had my sweatpants on the rocks, and that's on dogs. Once I once I grabbed my sweatpants, I heard the first shot. So I just stayed still, like I didn't even look. I just stayed still, looking at my shorts. Once I heard the first shot, cause you know it sounded like, you know, niggas. Anyways, boom. Then I heard the second, you know what I'm saying, then the rest. So niggas just bounce. I heard everybody about to bounce. We run down. You know, the first thing, I'm looking at everybody who's next to me, you feel me? Who wasn't next to me, you know what I'm saying? My nigga made it, you feel me? I'm over here like, yo, Mata, what the fuck? I ran straight back up, nigga. 
And it, you know what I'm saying? It was made it right there. And I went crazy, man, on dogs. I thought he was good. I thought he was just gonna make it. I thought he was gonna be alright. Mm. I don't know. I was like shocked. I didn't. I didn't know that shit happened at the time. Like I couldn't believe it. But I, I knew it was real because I seen everybody's faces. Like shit ain't no joke. Get out. My phone rings and it was Rosie. She's like, "Oh, I'm with my sister. Um, my brother just got shot. Just um take care of." My mother and my father just make sure they don't um, pick up the phone. And I'm thinking like, oh, they shot my dad, he got that. I'm thinking like, nothing happened to him. You know, I seen him on the ground and I got up to a run and I was like, come on, Mata. And you know, they left. I'm thinking that he's covering himself for like shields. So he dropped to the ground. But I kept calling his name, he didn't answer. so. When I started walking up to him, that's when I see that he wasn't okay. My phone kept ringing, 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 and then it was, it was one of his friends, so. Like, I thought they was calling for him, because, you know, when they couldn't get in contact with him, they would just, like, call me. So I'm like, let me just answer and tell them that he's not here. So when I answered, like, they, he was like, Oh, um, like, he was like yelling at me on the phone, um, like, oh, why the fuck are you picking up your phone? And I'm like, girl, what the fuck? I'm like, I'm fucking sleeping. <clears throat> and that person was just like, yo, my cat just got shot in the head. And like, it just, you know, I was still like half asleep. It took me a minute to like register that through my head, like, what? And then he just like hung up. I don't know what happened. And, I remember I just screamed, like, and I woke up my daughter. We drove to Boston Medical, kind of staying there like for maybe 20 minutes. And I'm like, damn, they're not here yet because they told us they, they took him in the ambulance. But um, but I said, come on now, it's 15, mi 15 minutes and they, you know, and they haven't said anything. So I said to, um, to my sister, I said to Rosie, hey, I think we gotta keep it moving. I think my mom was calling too. And all these phone calls kept coming one after the other. I said, something is not right. So I started calling, ignoring all the calls that were coming in. And I started calling every single hospital around to see where they took him. Um, then I finally called Bringing in Women's because I'm driving everywhere, but I want to make sure that the place I go next, he will be there. So I said to her, and she's like, can you describe him for me in order for me to kind of give you some information over the phone because I'm not able to do it. And she's like, I'm really sorry. I said, I'm just going to describe him. If you see someone that look like, like look at the description that I'm going to give you, just let me know so I can drive over and see, you know, that I'm kind of close to something. So I said, you know, he's tall, he's heavy set, you know, he's he just got his hair cut, you know, tiene pelo bajito, and he must have his, his idea or something on him. And for sure, he has a white T-shirt. <laughs> Even though I didn't see him that day, I didn't I didn't see him that day. He just loved the white T-shirt so much that I knew that. It, w it was probably the closest thing that was going to have me to his description. So she's like, yes, yes, we have someone that looks, yeah, yeah, we have someone that is, is kind of, you know, is, is, is close to the, to the um, information that you're giving me. So yes, we have someone that just arrived a couple of minutes ago. Yes, the description that you're giving me, you know, they are correct. And yes, he does have the white t-shirt on. I just said, okay, all right, oh, thank you, you know. So we head in there, we're already outside almost. Because we, we went through every single red light that you can think of. I said, hey, I'm sorry, but if you stop me, I'm just gonna tell you, I gotta, I gotta you know, I gotta get close enough, I gotta, I gotta be there. So when we got there, the place was crowded and they wouldn't let us see him. And they left us there for like hours and hours. And I don't know, I felt inside of me, like after like half an hour, I was like, I told the security guard, I was like, why don't you guys just tell us he's dead? Cause I mean, what are you guys waiting for? 
Cause it, it it was just like how it was. Like if it, if he would have been alive, they would have said, okay, so let's have like his mom or her sister come inside and see him. Or they would have said, okay, he's fine, but we need to do this and this and that. And they wouldn't tell us anything. And then the hospital got packed. There was people, like they had to call for extra security. They It was crazy. There was people outside. There was people outside across the street. Like they, like, it was out of control. Like the amount of people that were at the hospital. Well, on my way to work, Kathy called me, crying hysterically. And I'm like, Kathy, what's wrong? She goes, they shot Mata. I'm like, what? What do you mean they shot Mata? She's like, yeah, they shot Mata at the park. She's crying hysterically. She's telling me to go and meet her, that she's scared because they told her that he, he stopped breathing at a point. And I'm like, Kathy, calm down, because he'll be good, you know. It's Mata, like. A lot of people get shot and they are right. And Mata was a strong ass nigga. I honestly thought he would have made it. My mother was still calling. And I just said to her, yes, um, you know, we found him. But I just think he got into a fight. You know, nothing big. And I'm there already. And I'm like, oh, no, nothing big happened. I'm going to wait until I see him. Then I'm going to call you back. I, and then she kept insisting, like, are you sure that nothing, you know. I said, no, 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 no. I haven't seen him yet. You got to wait until I see him. Then I'm going to call you. All right, bye, bye. I got to go in and I can be on the phone. Maybe. That going in never happened. I never end up going in. And yeah, then they took us into a little room and the nurse, she was cool. She was just like, um, we have to call the some person to come in and tell you guys and i'm like okay can you just tell us what's really going on and she was just like okay i'll just tell you but um don't react until like she told us not to react but it was crazy because how do you not react when they tell you that your brother is dead like she's just like okay i'm just gonna tell you guys because i know you guys already know i mean they made it pretty obvious oh and it was just it was really hot outside and we was just taking a walk and then my sister called me and you know and she, i couldn't really hear what she was saying because she was crying and then she was like oh you know um mata got shot mata got shot and i'm like okay but what happened you know i'm thinking like okay a lot of people get shot you know i'm thinking he's okay you know so she hung up on with me and she really didn't know what to tell me that's all she said and she said she was gonna call me back so i was confused you know but then my boyfriend was like, oh, my boy just called me and he was there where it happened and he got shot in the head. That's when I was like, whoa, hold on, you know? And I was walking to my house, you know, cause I was in the store and I was, I kept on crying and crying. And you know, he was telling me to calm down cause you know, there was a lot of people around and I'm crying. But you know, like I couldn't believe, I'm like, okay, what you mean he got shot in the head? So I just kept on crying and crying. And when I got home, um, I waited for my sister to come home and that's when we like just hugged each other and we started crying like damn you know you serious you know and then um she told me that you know we have passed away and I couldn't believe it well I heard my niggas voice you know what I'm saying I'm gonna fuck with y'all believe if y'all don't believe in God or what nigga I heard my niggas voice you feel me and my nigga told me nigga before 10 minutes before my mom called me and my mom passed away you know what I'm saying my man I love you rest in peace me and Halita, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? She she called me up 15 minutes after I heard my nigga's voice, you know what I'm saying? I'm over here hearing my nigga's voice and he said, you know what, Macho, they got me. But he was smiling. I'm you ain't gotta believe me, nigga. I know how my nigga smiles. I seen that smile a million times, nigga. And my nigga was smiling and he was like, yo, Macho, they, they got me. But you know what? I'm good where I'm at. They got me, but I'm good where I'm at. Don't you worry. I'm good where I'm at. You know what I'm saying? And I still couldn't believe it. You know, you know, you know how people say your mind's playing tricks on you. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't. I, I I didn't really. I heard it. You know what I'm saying? I heard the words, and I just couldn't believe. It. I was like, nah, fuck that. You know what I'm saying, nigga? Then they gave me the phone call. My mom, dudes, hit me up, nigga. She told me what it was, nigga. She dropped the bomb on me. You know what I'm saying, my nigga? So. And I loved him. Like, I I love him a lot. And he used to tell me that when I grow up. That to do good and he never wants to see me in the streets. Because if he sees me in the streets, he's going to kick my ass or some shit. Mm -hmm. I always used to laugh. But, um, 
I, when, I, when I found out that he was dead, I was at my father's house. And I was sleeping. I was very knocked out. You know how I do. And my uncle woke me up. He's like, yo, your sister's on the newspaper. I'm like, yeah, right. And I thought it was for the double dutch stuff that she does. And then I saw her, Blackie, and Big Macho. Like, what the hell? And then I saw Martha's picture. And it's a 20-year-old man shot, dead. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. And then I fold the paper up just so you could see his face only. And I went on MySpace, saw everybody's picture. And I did not want to believe it for nothing. And when I went home, I saw everybody crying. Like, everybody, like, the main people in my house was crying. I couldn't believe it. And I was crying because, like, the day before he got shot, before I left to my, my grandmother's house, um, he, he gave me a dollar and he told me what was I doing in the streets. I'm like, nothing, riding bikes with my friends. He's like, oh, well, you better stay out the street. Just stay up. Make sure nothing happens to you. And he gave me money. He was like, go to the store. I'm like, all right. It was hard because it, I was trying to keep my aunt sane. Um, she was just pacing back and forth with her hands on her head. Um, my uncle was, he was okay. He put on the news and I was trying to um, just keep my aunt away from the room so she won't see anything. Um, once the news hit, that they got information that um, Martha had passed away. Everyone in the room just shut down. Um, I remember walking out and just, my aunt hadn't seen the video yet. I mean, the news. And I just remember coming out with my hands on my head. Like, I can't believe it. And once my aunt seen that, her eyes, like, it, it was, I can't even describe it. Like the, her, the pain in her eyes was crazy. She felt like disappointed. She was so furious. She was so sad. She just collapsed. And I honestly didn't know what to do. I seen him like a day before that on top of Boylston. Um, I was getting something to eat with my, with my wife and my kid. And um, you know, we, we spoke briefly, you know, and we spoke about how hot it was. It was nice out. You know, there was a lot of a lot of talk going around this and that. But um, he was, you know, he was his, his regular self. You know, just he was doing him. He was happy. He had that big smile on his face. You know, the next day, my cousin called me. I was in I was in uh, Dorchester, and he was telling me, but he wasn't saying his name right. So I didn't, I'm like, who, who are you talking about? He was saying some name. And then when I realized he said Martha, I was like, nah, get out of here. I was in Dorchester, so I automatically, you know, jumped in the whip, came right over here to this side of town, <laughs> seeing what was going on to come find out it was true. And I mean, I didn't, I was really in disbelief. I, don't, I didn't believe it for, for a day or two. Like, it didn't hit me, you know what I mean? Like, it, it really didn't hit me. To this day, I still, I st it's still, it, it, it sunk in, but I, I still think I'm gonna see him. You know what I mean? Like, I still feel like, I see people that look like him. I swear to, I swear to God, it's him. Yo, E, yo, E, where were you when, when he passed? Like, do you remember where you were? Sweeping the floor for the white man. I was in jail. I don't want to get into that, but it should fuck me up. Because I'm not here with you, yeah. he, used to, he used to ask for you every fucking, every other three weeks I used to see that nigga, man, like, yo, where the fuck is he at, where the nigga popping out, he used to know, he used to check up on you, so he knew about you, but, yeah, man, he used to show love, he used to show love, go by my window and shit, whip, acting a fool, and then pouring out some money and shit, and that's something that I try to keep, you know what I'm saying, so I can keep myself moving, because, man, I should have fucked my whole, my whole movement up, man, like, he's definitely, you know what I'm saying, definitely, you know, I'm trying to tell that shit up.
saying? Not that many people gonna get that money. This is the way Mata wrote in the streets and this is something I learned from him because he told me this and you know other people have heard it before. You know, it's better to be respected than to be feared. He wasn't a dude that was feared. He wasn't, like I keep saying, he wasn't out to hurt anybody, but he was respected. He used to respect people. That's why people loved him because like I said, he treats you how you treat him. So if you came out of him in a good vibe, he was going to come at you in a good vibe. And you know, most of the time people came up to him like, oh, I heard about you, you're a cool dude, like, oh, you're Mata from Boston, so people used to come up to him and show him love, he used to say the same love back. So that was the type of dude he wasn't. He was a dude that used to protect his hood, he used to protect the people he was around. Like, he was like, he was like a protector. Like, he was out here and like, he made sure this was good, like, we was good, you know what I'm saying? Because he was out here and like, he wasn't gonna let nothing go down. So like, he was that type of dude. Like, he used to show you love and, and protect you if he can, like, you know, help you in any way and just always make sure you're good. That's why everybody loved him, because he was that type of dude, he was a humble. It was, a, it was a tragedy that I never thought that I would go through. Like, I, I never thought that I would see anyone, like, pass away in front of my, in front of my eyes or in my arms or however you want to see it. I, I mean, it was, it was, it was tragedy to me. And ever since it's happened, it's like my life has been downhill. It's like tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And... I cannot explain how I felt that day and I can never be able to explain exactly how I feel because that has affected me and not only me, it has also affected my son's life a lot. Mata was an idol to my son. He knew what to say to my son. My son loved him and I mean this, I can't really, I don't like to get into details about it because it hurts me so much, you know, and I, I, I'm I'm just glad in in a way that I was there. I wish I wasn't there, but it also gave me a privilege to at least hold him for the last time, you know, and be able to tell him that everything's gonna be okay and that I loved him, despite whether I knew him five, ten years, it didn't matter. But at least when he passed, he didn't pass alone. He passed with somebody that he knew. I mean, I was fine for a little bit, but I just keep having tragedy after tragedy in my life, so... I mean, it hasn't ended. I just lost my son's father, of, like, almost four weeks ago, so... You know, and I... Tito lost his mom, and I lost my best friend in October, so it's like... I don't know right now, in my point of life, how much more I have to go through this, but I've always said that God is never going to give me something I can't handle and I have to move on from this and I know I have to but I feel right now it's not the time when I feel like I can move on from this I will but as long as as long as I feel the way that I feel I'm never going to forget about him I'm you know that was my first time experience with him and I'm glad that I was there to at least hold him in Look at him in his face and tell him that he'll be okay. It's like, this is what type of nigga this was, dog. We called this nigga at like 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> talk about, yo, let's get some shovels, nigga. We're about to dig a hole. Nigga. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> nigga, for real. For real. We go to Franklin Park, nigga. We start digging a hole, nigga. <laughs> right? It's for my dog, though. My dog had got run over by a car. And he helped us bury it and shit. <laughs> yeah. But me, him, Joel, my girl, nigga, went up to Franklin Park. One o'clock in the morning, I'm uh, serious. I just called him like, yo, we're gonna go dig a hole, nigga. Nigga ain't asked me no questions. Like <laughs> but just to show that the nigga just ain't give a fuck, nigga. Mad cool, nigga. Good people, man. It's family, you know, it's family, my cousin nigga. right there, nigga. I'm like his little brother, nigga. nigga. It's like one of my sons, nigga. You know what I mean, love him, love my heart, nigga. That nigga was like an older brother to me, man, you know? I used to wear that nigga's clothes, nigga, you know what I'm saying? That's how cool me and that nigga was, nigga, you know? I used to take showers in his house and shit, nigga, you know? That nigga will be missed, nigga, but never forgotten, nigga. You know? We out here, and we love you, my nigga. Love okay. about King Mata. Well, he was real, like, you know what I mean? If, if he loved you, he loved you. He always had you, you know what I mean? And you know you always had him back. Like, he knows who's his people, you know what I mean? To this day, he knows. You know what I'm saying? He knows who's real or not. <laughs> he was a real nigga. He, he always had your back no matter what.
you could have had just met him one day right there. Like, I come through with one of my boys from around Dorchester, sir. Like, yo, this is my nigga, made it right here. Like, oh, yeah, what's good, baby? Oh, I right. made it, nigga. Like, <coughs> yo, like, yo, yo, you want to smoke, though? Yo, yo, man, yo, bro, son, yo, spark, nigga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, man, it was, was that dope, nigga. It was a good person, though, man. A real person. Somebody will be there for you anytime, any day. Yeah. But I remember he was talking to me about like, how we all got to eat. Everybody get, everybody gotta get money. Cause, cause they just gotta support each other. Like that's how it is. Like if we all get money together, then we all gonna move up. And he was just trying to keep people as one, like together and shit. That's a lot. Not a lot of people could do that. I don't know people that could do that. Like he used to bring mad people out here. Like girls, girls used to come down, beep the horn. Mad niggas like. Like five, like five out of ten cars that drove down Boylston would say what up to my like That's that's how many people knew him. He knew a lot of people and shit. He was a real dude. That's why everybody had love for him. I can't really say you can move forward, you know, move on because, like I keep saying, there's somebody that is always gonna be in my memory and and you know, to the day I'm old with the guys, like we won't be talking about yo. You know, like he's always gonna come up because he was around in my memories. Like, you know, I was here, like, it was, this was the hood, just all things that people can think about just happens. And, like, you're always gonna have that memory, like, yo, you remember that day we was over? Oh, yeah, Mata was there, remember? Yeah, yeah, like, he's always gonna pop up, so there's no way you can move on. There's no way to, like, not think about it. It's just, just gotta, like, just learn from the experience and just everybody just, you know, see, see what happens and, you know, like, just try to get from all the negative, the, the little bit of positive, you know, like that, from, from the environment, just grab that and just, you know, try to run with that. And, you know, because there's no way you can move forward. There's no way to move forward. He's always gonna be there. He's always gonna be in here. Even for the people that didn't know him that well like that, you just seen him around, say what's up to him. That's, that's just, just changed their life completely right there. Just that, him being gone, not being used to him coming down the street always, always be eight in the morning, and then he'll be right there in the corner, one of the first motherfuckers out here. Like the neighborhood, the city, the world, just like lost on the ghetto, John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King type status. Like it's just, it's just bigger than words. He was, he was bigger than words. Like he was just, he was the soul and spirit of a whole era, of a whole time, of a whole community. You know what I'm saying, and uh, he, it, his era may have been short-lived, but it was powerful, and and, and it was and, and, and it's something of legends. It's something that it's something that Hollywood needs to make a movie about. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm from a very different mentality old school. You know, when the L ran in Eggleston, it was an Eggleston Square station. You know, due to that time, and I'm talking about Omi Earl. Um, Celito, Froggy, dudes that grew up in our neighborhood, I mean, you know, we were just some tight kids, you know what I mean? We were just always looking out for each other's back. You know, and at that time, what made it really different was that because everybody had to come through our neighborhood to get to their neighborhood, they figured they could do their dirt in our neighborhood. And so that dirt meant that if my mother was walking down the street, why did my mother have to worry about tucking in her jewelry? And in response to that threat, dudes got together and said, you know, it just can't be like that, you know? And you're talking about at a time that the Hispanics, you can count them in a handful. Yeah. And there was no such thing as Dominican, Puerto Rican, or none of that beef stuff, you know? And you, if you spoke Spanish and you ate rice and beans, we were all the same. And over the years, you know, like I served my time in prison, I started hearing the little Puerto Rican and Dominican beefs. Then I started hearing, you know, Moza having beefs with Moza out of Boston, and beefs with this and that, you know? And that all comes in basically because it's all a pre programmed mentality. Because we're fighting for a block that technically we never own. And then we end up in the same jail block with the dudes that are supposed to be our enemies. And then when we get in there, we find out that the system kind of sets up in a way that, all right, you're Latino, so you're in this Latino jail block. And then they break you up even further. You know, are you Puerto Rican or are you Dominican? Now, you know, I grew up in Eggleston. When I got locked up, there weren't a whole lot of ex men that got locked up at that time. So when I got locked up, the only people that I knew from around the way was from the A, from academies. And so they were brothers. 
And when I hung with them, the Boricuas from Springfield or, you know, Dominicans from Connecticut or whatever would quickly tell me, yo, what you doing? Because when it hits off in here, are you with them or are you with us? Because by the shade of your color, your skin, and because you have a little bit of spick accent in you, you know what I mean? They're going to assume you're with us. So when the knives start throwing, you're going to get a catch a battle. And it was the first time ever I felt that racism type of stuff happen, you know, kind of come off of it. But I think the escalation comes in as, you know, as we become more, more embodied into this American mentality that violence is the way of life, you know what I'm trying to say? It becomes sort of a custom. I mean, there's a reason why those games sell the way they sell. You know, it starts from a very young age. You know, I don't, you can go back, I mean, the, the most bloodiest history in America didn't come during this time. It came in the 30s during Prohibition. You know, they took something away. They took alcohol away. Everybody went crazy, okay? And when they were killing each other, that was one thing. When they were killing each other, and I'm talking about the Latinos killing each other over alcohol, you quickly see how the laws got flipped, and they stopped doing that. But when it's us killing each other, there ain't no laws that's going to protect us. Ain't nothing they're going to do for us. Plain and simple. You know? They're looking for us. I mean, they win any which way. They win when one of us drop. They win when one of us gets locked. Because you become slave labor. Right from the jump. 50 cents a day. And that's where you know, it ends up going to, you know? I mean, when I see a Mata, I just see a Hector of that time. You know? Um, yeah, I didn't know Mata in that personal life, but I knew Hector in that personal life. I knew the musician, the artist who enjoyed painting murals, the guy who played chess. And a lot of people didn't know that he competed around the whole state chess tournaments, beating white boys and chinos in chess. You know, had all the capacity there to be something better. But you know, when you grow up thinking that your world is a four block radius, you're already growing up thinking you're pre-incarcerated. And then you become physically incarcerated. And then you end up being, you end up going in a coffin where it's the ultimate incarceration forever. So you're locked anyway. Um, and so when I see talks of capos and this and that, you know, and I heard about Mata, I, you know, it's just history repeating itself, you know what I mean? And somebody else is going to rise through ranks. And somebody else is going to continue to play the game. Um, you know, I'm not a preacher because to tell you the truth, you know, I know how it really is out there. And sometimes you could try to change as an individual, but sometimes it's a struggle within you. And that kind of led me back here to spontaneous celebration in a way. Because I wanted to come back to the neighborhood that I grew up in. Because I remember the first promise that I made to myself was, damn it, me and Hector had somebody like me, who knows where we would have been, where we would have gone. Um, because it was potential and always in our lives. This thing about, you know, I hate when it's the violence against ourselves, you know what I mean? Because we're still the smallest number. We're the growing population, but we're the least that owns anything in America. You know, we're the least that controls our own destiny. You know, we're the least that leaves gifts back to our children. Mm -hmm. And it's only been in the very last short couple of years that, yeah, a couple of us has risen to points of leadership and, and responsibility. You know what I mean? And, you know, especially at this time, you know, our president's black. You know what I mean? You know, we should be thinking about what should we take control of and, and sort of, and, and wrap it, you know, and put our hands around it and control again. You know, because, you know, to be an entrepreneur in America, you know what I mean? We all know that the light of the skin, the favor they're going to, you know what I mean, the favor they're going to they're gonna give that person. You know, when you have a you know, young man like, like Dante trying to break into this movie and this documentary and even music scene and stuff like that, you know what I mean? Sometimes it really does, it's all about who you know to get you through that door and, and you know, move you to the next level. And we need to become those people who can open those doors for those kind of people. You know what I mean? Because you're going to play this game for so long. You, know, you can only do it for so long. You know, I'm not saying, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a preacher. I don't tell nobody what's the difference between right or wrong. You know what's right for you. And if you feel like what you're doing is right, and that you can deal with the consequences that come with it, then that's what manhood's about. But pay those consequences by yourself. Don't make other people pay those consequences for you. You know, if he was around right now, he'd be, he'd probably be an inspirational leader for a lot of these young motherfuckers that don't know what they're doing, you know, nowadays. And um, so for him to have that respect is beautiful to see the, uh, the you know, like the, uh, the output that he had at his memorial, which was, you know, big, it was humongous. Yeah, y'all should have been there. It was basketball court and games and barbecues and all the kids was there. It was, it was beautiful. It was amazing. Thank you for everybody for showing up. And, um, 
and uh, he would have very very much appreciated that and you know he knew he was loved you know it's just a sad it, it just kind of hurts my heart that you know we had to see it happen this way I remember one time I was on on Boylston it was in 07 I believe it was cold as shit it was one of them days where it goes from hot to cold and I was cold as shit you know I'm a skinny ass nigga you know I got I got I, at least of me in my life <laughs> but I was freezing and without me even telling him, yo, I'm cold, bro, da -da -da, he knew that I needed to go all the way to Brockton. That's where I was living at the time. And I was all the way out here. So basically, without me even saying that, he came up to me like, yo, B, yo, you going, you going all the way to Brockton. Here's my hoodie. And that I forgot all about that. After he passed, gave it some time, went in my closet, and his hoodie was there. Yo, that's that's basically when I could say that that's that first time that shit hit me where I missed one of my niggas. You get what I'm saying? For the simple fact that he had heart for me that day when I was cold. You dig what I'm saying? And then Brockton's a long trip, man. I was in no car. I was walking. I was on my feet on the train and bus. I remember that it was like a sign once I seen the hoodie. You know what I mean? That. I got, I got to do something, and I, like I said, I remember the last thing I told them was, yo, I want to do a music video, so in a way, this is my way of keeping my word to them, you get what I'm saying? And through this whole process, like, I was cool with Mata, a lot of people were cool with Mata, but we ain't living in his house, we weren't, you know what I mean, his family, God bless them. But doing this project, I got to actually um, go to his house and eat a plate of his mom's food. And that shit was bomb. You know what I mean? And I got to see a side of Mata that I never really got to see. You know what I mean? And that shit open, it opens your eyes and you you learn. You learn. You learn this more. You know what I mean? Just because he was on the block, just because he repped Boylston, doesn't mean they was all bad. Doesn't mean that's, come on, that's what he, that, that's what he was criado. That shit, this, and then after doing this whole documentary for a year with my people, Dante Luna, P.S. We the best, you know what I mean? Them holding the cameras down, them editing them. It just opens your eyes when you see everything put together. Cause at first you see one, two, three tapes, you know what I mean? And you're there while you're videotaping, it's cool. But when you put everything together and you see the actual impact he really did have, and I hope y'all guys see this and actually, yo, my thought was, my thought wasn't just any ordinary cat, you know. He was, he held it down. For me in the beginning, everybody was telling me like to forgive and forgive and forgive. I don't know who they were telling me to forgive. Like who am I supposed to for I can't, what, I don't know who did it. So they would be like, oh, just, you know, forgive and you'll understand. Like just don't have that hatred. Because I was really mad for a long time. And I'm still mad, but I was like upset. Like I was just mad and instead i see a lot of people taking like that anger and turning it into, into like negativity and i had my negative points i had like yeah people like after when something like that happens like when you have someone taken away from you like that it's hard because like it it it's like somebody stealing something from you to, like that happiness i don't know it's just like some it's something that just gets out of like comes out of you when you hear something or something happens like that and what i try to do is like i don't know i've been trying to get back into youth work and trying to get the community more involved in what happens on the streets because people see stuff like that and they listen and they pay more attention to what the news has to say instead of like what really goes on because as soon as my brother passed away they were like oh gang member this gang member that i didn't see him as a gang member i saw him more as like because you grow up seeing these people and it's like mira them little kids on the corner the same little kids that are always on the corner that used to play baseball in the middle of the street using the light poles as bases and stuff like that like that's what you see and then when people when the media and all that starts to say, oh, the gang this, gang that, violence here, violence that. Like, the community takes that and, like, just sees it as something negative. Then they, everybody else who's, like, around that starts to get, like, that negative stigma from what the media is saying. So what I'm trying to do is wait. All this anger and, like, I don't know, frustration and just 
like the sadness of losing my brother, I'm taking all that in and I'm using it to build something from his name. Like I wanna, all these memorials every year, I wanna get them bigger and bigger so that the community, like the JP community can come together. Cause it's kind of separated right now if you really look at it. But with his memorials, I'm gonna expand it and try to make something out of it. Like I don't know what I really wanna make out of it but I want to make I know that I'm going to make something out of it either be like something to help the younger people in the community or the people that feel like they have to be in a certain place in JP like they can't they can't go to certain places or just young people that feel that way too so we're basically trying to you know create like a peace institute in the name of Lewis and you know to like to reach out to other people not just you know, it's not just going to be about Lewis, but, you know, other families that, you know, been impacted by, like, the same situation. And because, I mean, this is something that unfortunately happens <clears throat> all the time in these streets. And there's a lot of other families left out there, that, you know, the same way that. We didn't. Like, I lost my sister and I lost him, but I lost her because, you know, she died of natural causes. And then when I lost him, somebody took him away from me. So I was, like, confused on how to, like, react and how to keep, like, like just keep their memory alive and stuff. And it's, like, it's hard because some people get angry. Like, if I bring my brother up, like, the conversation starts subtle, but at one point, like, by the time the conversation's over, people will be mad because he was taken away from us. Mm -hmm. So, like, at times it's hard to just even talk about him without someone getting mad because of the way he passed away. But I feel like with, like, this thing that I'm trying to make, I wanted to, since it's going to be, like, some, it's going to have to do with peace and violence and, like, bring the community together. So maybe, I don't know, in five years, my dream is to have, like, I don't know, a foundation or, like, a, an organization in his name so that instead of like being mad when you hear his name or like turning it into anger because of the way he passed away turning it into some like something that like when you hear Louis Troncoso it'll be like oh that like it'll be not nah, oh my god that gangster that they killed on uh, at Stony Brook but it'll be like oh something good came out of his name like there's something positive going on with his name now out of 365 days a year at least one day, every year of our lives, we celebrate our birth dates, the day we were blessed with time. They say the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But if that straight line was Route 95 with the traffic jam, then getting off the next exit and going local might be the shortest route. Time is a fourth dimension we forget about. As long as we have time, we'll always have the opportunity to change something about ourselves or learn something new. We could read 10 books in one day and wake up the next and learn something we never knew before. So time gives us new things to look forward to every day we wake up. It's only when we die, when our time stops, when we really can find out who we are.